Hi, welcome to the Signal Path. In this episode, we're going to fulfill a Patreon supporter's request and talk about near terahertz subharmonic mixers, the theory, the teardown, and the experiments that go with it. So I went out and bought a whole bunch of components to be able to do these experiments. And I really want to thank my Patreon supporters for making this happen. Several thousands of dollars of components are necessary for just this video alone. And some of you asked if there are other ways to support the channel. Indeed, there is a PayPal link that you can do a one-time or a monthly donation to the channel directly on my website, thesignalpath.com. So feel free to do that if that is your preferred method. None of my content is behind the paywall. If you're supporting the channel, you're supporting the entire community, and I really appreciate it. So let's take a look at these mixers and then talk about how they work. There's a lot here to cover. And here are harmonic mixers that we're going to explore and talk about. This particular one works from 90 to 140 gigahertz. You can see here's the waveguide port, and there's a short here to protect the diode inside when you're not using it. There's also a 75 to 110 gigahertz one, although on this label it says poor diode, which I assume is not an indication of its financial situation, but rather that the diode has degraded and therefore it's not working very well. Now you can use this on their own. You still need a diplexer to go with it, and this was quite hard to find, but here it is. We're going to also talk about why this is necessary and measure it as well. So there's a lot of content here, from the theory all the way to the experiments and the teardowns. So let's talk a little bit about the theory. So bear with me here. I'm borrowing some slides here from Wanritsu to make some important points before we begin testing these mixers. So a mixer fundamentally is nothing more than a multiplication device. It takes in a low frequency, multiplies it with the RF frequency, and that results in the plus and minus differences of the signals to appear at the IF much lower frequency. This is how we basically make any wireless system. Now most mixers are going to use the low signal coming in to be around the same frequency as the RF signal. This means that if you have an allo frequency over here, it's really close to the RF frequency that you're interested in. In this case, the upper sideband. There's also the lower sideband signal that could be there, and then both of those will get down converted to the IF frequency, which is the difference between the RF and the allo. And this is fundamental, and this is basically pretty much how everything works. But at the same time, there are a lot of variations on how mixers can be built. You can have image rejections, and IQ, and heterodyne, and somodyne, and so on and on. So we've talked about a lot of those on the channel. But in this case, I'm interested in finding out what is the absolute simplest kind of mixer you can make and how can we allow the LO frequency to have some freedom rather than being so close to the RF. And the reason for that is, if the RF signal is coming at 2.4 GHz, like a Wi-Fi system, making an LO signal at 2.4 GHz is not so difficult. But if the RF signal is coming in at, let's say, 100 GHz or 300 GHz, then you would have to generate an LO signal around the same frequency, which has its own challenges and a lot of power consumption is required to generate a signal at that frequency. So if there was a way to generate our LO signal at a fraction of the RF signal and use some kind of interesting nonlinear effect to get close to the RF internally, that would be great. That's in fact how harmonic mixers work. A harmonic mixer typically relies on the generation of a harmonics of DLO before the mixing happens, whereas a subharmonic mixer combines those two steps into one. That's not always strictly true, but we'll see that in a second. So the goal here is to be able to somehow use this LO frequency at a fraction of the RF. Now we said that we need a nonlinear device. So what happens if you use a linear device? Well, if you use a linear device, let's say like a resistor, its IV characteristics is just going to be a line, which means that if I apply a signal to it, the signal that I receive on the other side is going to look exactly the same. This IV characteristic is a one-to-one -one translation. Only the amplitude will change. As a result, the input frequency and the output frequency are going to have say, the same frequency content and no nonlinear effect happens. This cannot be a mixer as a result. Now all I need to do is to introduce a little bit of nonlinearity. Even a piecewise linear system like this with a straight line and a constant slope will give us some nonlinearity. So in this case, the input signal is applied like this, and because we do have a flat region on the left side, we get nothing at the bottom, and then we get a linear response on the other side. So basically, the sinusoid gets chopped in half. Now, right away, you can notice that even though this does have a lot of the frequency content of the original signal, the discontinuities between those is going to introduce higher frequency content. So we're moving in the right direction. But if I make this even more nonlinear, we can, of course, use a diode, like a Schottky diode, that has a really nice exponential relationship. In this situation, because of this exponential curve over here, the same signal on the other side becomes narrower and narrower, resembling more and more like an impulse train. And right away, you notice that this is going to have a lot more high-frequency content. Now, the extreme version of this is to use what is essentially like a 90-degree bang. And this is, although not fully realizable, will be the perfect situation, because a sinusoid going in will turn into a train of impulses. Now, a train of impulses in the time domain is also a train of impulses in the frequency domain. 
and it's going to translate a single tone in all of its harmonics. Now a step recovery diode that has this impulse shape response emulates this effect pretty closely. And we've talked about step recovery diodes in previous videos and how they work in some of their applications, for example, in samplers and frequency counters. But the idea here is to turn a single si frequency omega n into all of its harmonics. So omega n will sit over here, two, mo two omega n over here, all the way to infinity omega n. And because of the duality between time and frequency, you get an impulse train in the frequency too which is fantastic. And now, this is the difference between a subharmonic mixer and a harmonic mixer. Typically, harmonic mixers first do this, and then they allow you to pick whichever harmonic you want to use for conversion, and then that harmonic becomes the ELO of the mixer. Whereas a subharmonic mixer combines these steps into one. So this is how most modern spectrum analyzers perform really high frequency down conversion, which goes way beyond their own internal ELO frequency. And this is how a system like that looks like. And even though this is an Anritsu system, they all basically do the same thing. So in this case, for example, we have an uh, RF signal of 60 and a half gigahertz coming in. We can use a mixer with a, an eighth harmonic multiplication in it to give it only an LO frequency of 7.3 gigahertz, which means that 7.3 gigahertz times eight is going to give us an IF of 1.875 gigahertz, which means that we need a high pass filter and a low pass filter in order to separate the IF coming out and the LO going in. And this harmonic mixing is basically how everybody was doing this kind of system in the past. But there is a very, very big disadvantage to this. Even though the LO signal coming in at 7.3 you know, gigahertz here is pretty strong, all the harmonic that is generated inside of this mixer are going to have continuously reduction in amplitude, which means that because we are relying on this harmonic for down conversion, the eighth one in this case, we're getting a significantly lower LO power into our mixer. As a result, the conversion gain of this mixer will continue to suffer as you increase the harmonic multiplication. And that's the basic disadvantage of this. Noise figure and harmonic loss are going to be pretty bad. But nonetheless, because you're able to generate such a low frequency, it means that I can take a spectrum analyzer that, for example, only works up to 10 gigahertz and use that with a subharmonic mixer and down convert signals far above 10 gigahertz down into an IF that this spectrum analyzer can measure. And that's the fundamental idea. Now right away you will also notice that there is a challenge here. Because we're using a multiplication of the LO and because there is no image rejection, you cannot differentiate whether the signal is in the upper sideband or lower sideband once the down conversion happens. And for that there is something called signal ID detection, which all spectrum analyzers that use this technique use. We will actually demonstrate this in our experiment as well. And what we do is that we move the LO signal back and forth. If you move the LO signal back and forth a little bit, the IF will move in opposite direction of the LO or with LO depending on whether it's in the lower sideband or upper sideband. And with that technique you can find out which image you're looking at. It's clever and simple and it requires you to make multiple measurements by moving the LO around, but this is basically how everybody does it. It's a software pre-selector and we will see that in action when we're going to measure our circuits. And with that information, we can now appreciate the clever simplicity of these waveguide mixers that we want to measure. So here's a kind of a block diagram or a functional diagram of how this thing works. We have a standard waveguide flange, and that's where the RF frequency at very, very high frequencies enters these mixers up to, you know, 325 gigahertz or so. So the waves travel through the waveguide, and there is a rectangular to rigid waveguide in there that squeezes down the wave around the diode that we're using for detection. I'll show you that in a little bit more detail. Just for now, assume that the RF signal comes in and hits this mirror and somehow couples into it. So basically the waveform modulates the voltage across the diode that's inside. This diode is absolutely tiny. But that's not enough because you still need to apply an LO signal to this diode so that the RF and the LO would mix. And the LO signal comes over here in some filter network and then that's also applied to the diode. Note how the LO is coaxially connected to the diode, whereas the RF signal is not. It's just squeezed around and couples into the structure of the diode itself. There's an equivalent inductor on the other side, which isolates, of course, everything else as well. And then there's the waves that go right over this diode eventually have to be absorbed at the end of the waveguide into some structure, which we will also see when we take a look at it. Now this is a diode is only a two terminal device, which means that if you have the RF going right over it and coupling into it and the LO connected to it, the IF needs to share one of those ports. And the only port it can share is the LO port because they're around the same frequency or close to each other. 
and that signal then coming back over here will be the IF signal that appears on this. So in this case, DLO will be at a few gigahertz, IF will be at a fixed frequency, in this example is at 2.072 gigahertz for these diodes, and the RF can be a really wide range. So the spectrum analyzer sweeps DLO, and of course monitors what's coming in, and the IF being produced is correlated, and then you figure out what frequency it is at. And these filter networks allow you to separate the LO and the IF from each other so that they are diplexed together on the same wire. And there is a diplexer that goes with these mixers, which we will also take a look at as well. So this is the entire structure. It is as simple as it can possibly be. But the fundamental idea in terms of EM design is still not easy because there's a lot of things happening here that needs to be taken care of. And in fact, they give you a cross section of what this looks like, which is kind of cool. And here's the cross-section design, so we can really appreciate the cleverness a bit more. So the RF signal comes over here, and this rigid waveguide squeezes the signal so that all the RF signal is focused and concentrated on the junction of the diode. And that diode is this tiny little thing sitting right over here in the middle. At the very bottom of it, there's this so-called cat whisker probe, which just connects the bottom one side of the diode to the body of the mixer, grounding it essentially. And then on the other side, it makes a gentle connection to this piston looking thing, which is actually a low pass filter itself. And this is a very simple design of a low pass filter in a microwave cavity around it. And there is some Rexolite cover around it so it doesn't short with anything. So everything is really super delicate. And the IF goes over this way and the IF comes out of the other side. And then the ridge opens back up and there is some uh, tapered RF load, which I suspect is some kind of an absorber in there. So the waveform that hits the end cover and comes back and has a chance of getting absorbed in the uh, RF absorber once again. And that's the entire structure. That's how this thing works. RF comes in, squeezes into the junction, LO hits the junction at the same time, they mix together because the diode is nonlinear, produce an IF signal that coaxially connects through the low-pass filter back into the IF line that goes out. And the diplexer then later separates these two that's the entire structure. So now I really want to see, can we actually make this, turn this on and measure it and use it in our, one of our system? Now there is one additional challenge we need to be careful of. As with any diode, if you put a large LO signal across it, it will not just mix and create harmonic, it will also mix with itself, which means it's going to generate a large DC value. That DC value is the rectification of the diode. It will rectify it and it will create a large DC voltage across the diode and some current through it. Now if you do that, then you'll get no conversion because you need to bias this diode at a very critical point. So if the diode has a response that, for example, looks like this, you really want to be biasing it around this area so that you can swing back and forth between the two nonlinear region, which means it's not sufficient to just apply it in low and look for an IF. You also need to apply a DC. So now we have another complication. We need to apply an RF, we need to apply an LO, we need to monitor and apply an DC and then monitor the IF in order to get the conversion. All of that stuff is typically removed from the user's concern because the user just connects this to the spectrum analyzer and the spectrum analyzer does this for you. But in reality for us to build a benchtop version of this, we need to worry about all of that. But there are several steps that I want to go through to figure out how this works. First, I want to measure this diode, which is not easy. We're going to use the source mesh unit to figure it out because it's absolutely tiny. If you connect a multimeter to this, you will destroy it immediately. So you have to be pretty careful with it. So we're going to measure the diode to make sure it's okay, measure its IV characteristic, understand where the knee response is, and then build a setup around it. And we also have the diplexer we need to measure, which its response is going to help us understand where the LO and the IF signals are going to be. So there's a lot of cool experiments that Ahead. So which harmonic number are these mixers actually using? Here's a list of all the Tektronix harmonic mixers that were available back then, starting from 18 gigahertz and ending all the way at 325 gigahertz. And if you look at the LO harmonic number, the LO harmonic number continues to grow, which makes sense because the LO range of the spectrum analyzer is fixed. So the only way you can convert 325 gigahertz for the same LO that you were using at 26 and a half is to increase the LO harmonic number. So the two mixers that I have are 75 to 110 and 90 to 140. And these two use both the 23rd harmonic and there's a big overlap between them, which kind of makes sense. But if you look closely, even though the conversion loss is not listed, you can see that the detectable signal keeps getting worse and worse and worse as you go to higher frequencies. And that's because the conversion loss is worse, the noise figure is worse. And as a result, you're going to get less and less dynamic range that you're able to measure using these mixers. And the frequency flatness isn't super great, but for a lot of applications, especially back then, this would have been an amazing thing to have anyway. 
So if you're looking at the 23rd harmonic, we can very easily calculate what LO frequency we need to apply by dividing the 90 by 23 and 140 by 23, and that's the range of LO signals we need. And we need to apply about 10 to 15 dBm or so, uh, as well as the DC bias that I just talked about. So at least we know where we should start. So let's go ahead and use the Keithley 2470 SMU to do the IV characteristics of the diode inside of the mixer. You can see here the diode's IF port is directly connected to the SMU and that way we can apply voltage and limit the current in a really precise way as expected from a Keithley SMU. I've done extensive reviews on all the graphical SMUs, they're fantastic essentially industry standard uh, products at this point and you can see how the different models compare and what they can do. Now there is a licensed app actually inside of this that I have installed for this particular one which is an IV tracer and this IV tracer allows you to turn this into like a good old Tektronix IV tracer using this knob to travel across a different voltage. So we can go ahead and run this and then it gets you into its own little GUI and then you can adjust it. Now this IV tracer is actually even more powerful if you install it on the 2461 which I accidentally did not know ahead of time so I installed it on the 2470 but hopefully we'll get a license for that one as well. And the reason is because that one has a very high frequency sampler as well as a DAC allows you to do it much more sophisticated than quick measurements. But nonetheless we can set it up over here so I can go under setting here and we have to be very careful here, make sure that we set things up not to damage the diode. So first thing is to change the polarity. Now I can only go either positive or negative on the 2470. I'm not sure why I can't just travel from minus to positive because this is a four quadrant instrument so you should be able to do it. I don't know why that limitation is there. Now we can change the peak here, we don't need to go over one volt here. These diodes have very low turn on voltage so we don't need to push them very hard. And here we want to really limit the current. I'm going to limit the current to 200 microamp. These are tiny, tiny diodes. We don't want to damage them. So this is a really basic and straightforward setup. That's really all you need to do. Now if you go under home here, and if you go and turn this on, you're sitting at zero volts and zero amps. So there's no current right now going through the diode, which makes sense because we're not forward biasing it yet. So let's go ahead and travel across here. And then you can see that it is going to slowly move forward. Now one little complaint I have is that I wish there was a setting here where it would allow you to set a fixed step at every one of these clicks because it does have acceleration built in. And that can sometimes be a little bit difficult to use. But right now we can see we're still taking no current. Hopefully it will hit some turn on voltage, otherwise this diode is bad. There you go, look at that. There you go, the diode is turning on and you can see very, very quickly going through strong conduction here. So we get a reasonably good line here. You can see it jumps around because it's uh, the diode has an exponential relationship here. So, But nonetheless, we get a reasonably good shape. There you go. So it does have a very good response and I think this diode looks like it's okay. Now the turn on voltage is over half a volt, so it's a little high, but I think it should be okay for our purposes. And if I go too, too high, you can see if I go too fast towards the end, for example, I'm going to very quickly hit the limit. So it, it will not damage the diode, which is fantastic and what you would expect. So I can go ahead and save this. Actually, and turn this off and I can compare this and I can save this as a reference. So now it's in the memory. The next time I change diode, I can use this and overlay the data over the next measurement. Okay, I changed the mixer. This is now another 90 to 140 gigahertz mixer here. So let's go ahead and turn this on and then we can bring from compare and put the old values there. Let's go ahead and see what happens. So it's still traveling at zero at the hop. It's exactly like the other one, but look at that. This one starts conducting much, much earlier. That is great. Yeah, it's jumping around a lot, but look at that. That is really nice. So this is a much, much sharper and starts much, much earlier. That's going to be quite helpful by changing the biasing of this and basically requiring potentially even a, a lower LO drive. But now you can clearly compare these two diodes. Now it looks like these two mixers were made quite a bit of time apart, and it just perhaps means that they have a much better diode in the case of this other newer model than they have with the old ones. But the bend is still extremely sharp. We do have a very similar characteristic, just shifted forward a little bit closer. This forward bias here just starts just around 270 millivolt or so. So fantastic. So I think both of these diodes are actually okay. Let's try the last one. And here's the last mixer. This is the one that was labeled as having a poor diode from 75 to 110 gigahertz. Now I didn't turn this off in this situation because I can only show two values at a time and I wanted to keep the old ones there. So now we can increase the voltage and see the conduction of this one. No conduction yet. 400 millivolt. 500. Nope, still nothing. And nope, still nothing. So we went basically to the end and there is absolutely nothing. I think that just means that this diode is actually dead. There's nothing there. So that's unfortunate. 
But this also means that we can take it apart without feeling guilty and see exactly how it is put together from a microwave point of view, how the transitions are. It's going to look really interesting on the inside. So let's go ahead and take apart the broken mixer over here. We all have a lot of knowledge now about how this should look like on the inside. So it should be exciting to compare that versus the drawing. So we can take this off. This is a short circuit. At the very top here is just to protect the diode when it is open so that because capacitive events can certainly damage this. We can tell this is a short because it's entirely made of metal. There's no Teflon inside of that connector. And here is the main SMA which we apply the yellow and also we expect that to have a really cool little tip at the end that connects to the diode. We should, we should be able to see that. But first let's take a look at the end of this. Now we know the end of this is terminated in a short circuit and that short circuit in a waveguide is nothing more than just a simple plate over here. So I should be able to remove that and we should observe a simple short circuit hopefully. And the back of this should be pretty clean and polished. Everything here is really dirty but that's because the metal is tarnished. There we go. And look at that. There's a short at the end. Yep, that's a perfect short. So there's nothing here. That's just simply a perfect reflection. And there should be an absorber in there. And I think I see it. Yeah, there's an absorber in there for sure. The question is, can we get that absorber out without taking this further apart? I think we're going to have to open it up a, a little bit more before we can do that. All right, well, let's take all the labels off and start disassembling it more. And here's where the diode assembly would be inserted. So this end of this pin must be the end where the other side of this pin has the diode connected to it. So we have two screws over here which we can remove. Okay, the pins are gone. There's some looseness in there. Oh, there we go. Let's remove this carefully here. See if we can get the pin out. Ah, there it is. There is the pin. There should be an absolutely minuscule diode connected to the end of this. We can remove it without damaging it further. That should be great. Ah, there it is. Look at that. Do we see a diode? Oh yeah, look at this. I see something. There's definitely a diode at the tip of that. It looks like it's completely bent downwards. I'm going to try and see if I can straighten it so that later on we can put it under the microscope and take a much closer look at it. But there's definitely something at the tip of that. So let me put this aside so we don't damage it any more than it already is. And then inside of this, all we see a hole all the way down. And on the other side of that should be that funny looking filter at the end of this structure. So let's remove that. All right, let's see how much this matches the drawing. That should be interesting to see. <laughs> there it is. It's almost exactly like the drawing. Ah, look at that tiny little filter. That's really cool. Very simple and elegant design. So basically what happens is that the end of this pin, where the diode is, which is now bent, would be touching this perfectly and gently. And that would create the connection. And the waves travel right over it. And that's how the RF couples into it. The LO and the IF are coaxially connected, but the RF is through a waveguide electric field and magnetic field, of course, connected. Very interesting and tiny. Okay, so we should be able to now take this further apart because the body of this should have further secrets in it because we do also have now the hole is, by the way, completely see-through on both sides. There you go, nothing special. And that should be a cavity there, right there, is where the waveguide squeezes down around that diode. It's just like the drawing. It's really cool. And then we should be able to see that RF absorber too. I think it just has a couple of screws on this side. So let me remove all of that and take a look at it. So while I was disassembling it, the RF absorber started to become loose and we expect this to be tapered. And look at that, it is tapered. That is so cool. It's exactly like the drawing. Oh, the tip of it is broken. Yeah, there is our RF absorber. So it takes the shape of the actual waveguide. And as it, the waveguide pinches down, this thing goes with it so that it makes a perfect termination. So this is basically sitting on top of this and the waveforms come in. Once they are past the diode, they're no longer needed. You don't want to build any reflections, so it goes right over this RF absorber through the channel of the waveguide as it widens up, and then it hits the short circuit over here, which was covering the back piece right here, and then it comes back and has another opportunity to be reabsorbed into this, so nothing comes back. It's a very simple termination, and it's probably quite effective as a result. But now we have all the screws out, I believe, and this should separate now. And it does. Yeah, look at that. There it is. There's our channel. And if you look carefully, it is definitely pinched down. So it's a rigid uh, waveguide. Very cool. So the waveform enters the waveguide here. It gets 
pinch down progressively until it becomes a super narrow where the diode sticks out right over here and then it widens again and then gets absorbed in the RF absorber. The absorber is basically sitting sitting in this in this channel. Of course not on its side, but completely flat, something like that. Very cool. And the other side of this should be essentially completely symmetric, except that oh no, this one is actually totally flat. Yeah, you, do, you don't need the you don't need to make the rigid waveguide on both sides. You can make it just on one side, so it's a little bit asymmetric. I think the drawing also showed that. That's all there is. <laughs> and amazing. I don't think it could be any simpler than this. And this is really easy to machine, if you think about it, because you can machine it with a gradient moving upwards. You can see even some marks of the machining right there. That's pretty easy to make. You could even make this on just a basic CNC machine. Very cool stuff. 90, this is 75 to 110 gigahertz. So the waveguide size is determined by that, of course, WR10. But we could make the waveguide even smaller for the higher frequency ones. The 90 to 40 has smaller one, but it's exactly the same structure. So that's the beauty of the physics here, because you can just make this essentially at any frequency. All you just have to do is scale the dimensions and the diode and everything. Of course, the diode needs to become faster with higher frequencies, but I suspect they're using the same diode everywhere, and the conversion loss just gets worse and worse. Really cool. Yeah, so now all of its secrets are known, including the diode. Let's take a look at that diode under the microscope. And here is the tip of that pin magnified by a factor of 50 looking from the top. And you can see the top of the pin over here and the diode connected to it. Here's the leafy top of the diode that's supposed to touch the SMA connector with the built-in filter. And the other connection of the diode goes into this pin, which is connected to the body, the ground body of the mixer itself. So this is, tells us a little bit about how tiny that diode is. It's absolutely minuscule. It has to be in order for it to work at the frequencies it does. But the structure of it that we saw in that drawing is really vividly shown here. This diode is clearly bent downwards, and that's why it's not making any connection. Diode also may be damaged at the same time, but this leafy top should be pointing straight up towards the top of the screen, exactly the same way the top of this pin is pointing at. We can increase the magnification to take a closer look at it. And here's a magnification of 100, and the diode is definitely much more visible now. I changed this to a bright field, and you can clearly see going through the focal plane how that inner layer right this this inner layer right here is connected to the pin and the other side of that of the semiconductor is that leafy gold top which then goes into the other side now we can look even closer and we can see how the attaching is to the pin and here we are at a factor of 200 yeah that connection has definitely been bent going through the layers here's one the layers that separate this part goes down into the pin and the other side of that is that leafy connection and there's a little bit of defect here on here. This is probably where it was touching the bottom of that filter from the SMA connector. But yeah, here's the surface of this. There's some minor defect here on the surface too. And there might have been some damage to this diode right over here. And that could explain why something happened. Either fell or it was burnt out and it shifted due to a thermal event because it got so hot. Who knows what happened to it? But yeah, definitely the structure of it is so much more obvious now and how simple and elegantly it is put together. And here is a Tektronix Diplexer, which was quite hard to find, as these are, of course, not sold anymore. And if you look at this, it has three ports. We have the LO port, where the LO of the signal directly coming from the spectrum analyzer will be injected. And then we have the external mixer port, so the LO can travel from here to here, which means that the LO has a typically a high-pass or maybe a band-pass response, depending on the frequency range of the LO arriving at the mixer here. And then the response from the IF of the mixer comes back and goes through the IF. Now we also know from our analysis that IF is responsible for the DC as well as the IF carrier. So this must have a DC connection, but it also has to have a bandpass response to allow the IF to be connected to the mixer. You would really want this to be narrowband if you don't need to do broadband demodulation so that you can have as much isolation from the IF and LO as possible because you don't want this signal to leak in and go back into the spectrum analyzer. This cable over here and this connector is just to make it easy to interface to the spectrum analyzer this was designed to work with. It really doesn't do anything else. For our purposes, we can just remove them. But it's nice that it came with it. So we should be able to measure the response of this fairly easily by connecting it to a network analyzer. If you have a two-port network analyzer, you can measure the response in multiple steps. Or if you have a multi-port network analyzer, you can measure all of them at the same time. So we're looking for the characteristics of LO to external mixer response, external mixer to IF response, and IF to external mixer response because we need a DC to come back this way. So this thing does a lot of things at the same time. 
Now, net note how this is called a diplexer and not a duplexer. A duplexer is typically referred to something that has a circulator in it because it separates the same frequency into multiple ports. A diplexer allows different frequencies to be on the same coaxial line at the end, like for example how the external mixer has IF and a low both at the same time. A diplexer is made of high-pass, low-pass filters, a lot easier to build than a duplexer, which typically needs magnetic materials in order to make a circulator. There are exceptions to that, of course, you can make active ones and there are some tricks you can play, but generally that's how they are built. Now we have multi-port network analyzers here at the lab, so we should be able to very easily connect it up and measure it. And here we are, we have port 1 connected to the low port, port 2 connected to the external mixer port, and port 3 connected to the IF port. And that's where we can measure the S parameters of all the ports at the same time. And for that, we're going to be using the signal network analyzer. This is the SNA514A. I've done a full teardown and review of this instrument, which you can check out. But let's go ahead and take a look at the screen. And here is everything that we need to see to understand how the diplexer works. So at the top left, we have S21. This is the response from the LO port of the diplexer to the actual mixer. So here we expect a, a band where the LO signal can reach the mixer in the few gigahertz range. Since our diode is multiplied by 23, we're looking at around 4 to 6 gigahertz. And if you look, there is indeed a flat region here. And this flat region, operating from about 2 to 4 or 5 gigahertz, we have a reasonably good loss of a 0 0.2 0 0.3 dB. So that's perfect, which means that the LO signal can easily reach the mixer without any issues. Now here on the right side, on S32, what we have is the response of the mixer to the IF port. So in this situation, we need to make sure that there is a peak in there where it allows the IF signal center that is particular frequency to reach the spectrum analyzer, the IF coming back. And if you look, there is indeed a single peak here. I've already put a marker on it, and it's 2.072 gigahertz, which is exactly what the manual of the spectrum analyzer says it should be at. The IF of the mixer coming back has a very narrow band response, and that allows it to isolate everything else and allow just a single tone essentially to pass through and hit our spectrum analyzer. This also means that the noise and everything else, in particular the response from the LO will not reach the IF as we will see. So these two make perfect sense. This allows the LO to hit the mixer, this allows the IF to hit the spectrum analyzer. We also want to make sure that there is a good isolation between the LO and the IF such that the LO signal cannot reach the IF at all and that's the response over here, S31. And you can see that in the same frequency range where we do allow the LO to reach the mixer, here we have a huge attenuation. We do not allow the LO to reach the IF port and therefore the IF port of the spectrum analyzer is protected. We also have a reasonably good S11, meaning that in the range of frequencies where we're interested in passing the LO, which is over here, we have a good return loss coming back. But let's take a look at what happens here. Right at the frequency of the IF, we have perfect reflection coming back into the LO port, meaning that no matter what, the LO signal just simply cannot reach the IF port. So this tells us exactly how this diaplexer works and that it works really well. And we're going to use this information on top of everything else in order to be able to solve uh, adjust and self-bias the mixer and everything through the diplexer. Now note here is that the low frequency, the DC connection is not reliably measured here because the spectrum analyzer does not go down to DC and my ECAL nonetheless does not calibrate below 300 kilohertz anyway. So in order to find out the direct DC connection, we can use a simple multimeter for that just to see and make sure that we understand how the DC is passed through the diplexer in order to bias the mixer. So now let's take everything we've learned and build this setup to see if we can actually detect the 100 gigahertz signal using this harmonic mixer. So here's our setup. First of all, we need an LO source. The LO source for the mixer is going to come from this ERA instrument USB controlled synthesizer. It also connects to Wi-Fi, so I can control it through a web browser. I've done full teardowns and review of this. Definitely check it out. It's a really nice little synthesizer for lab use. So this is going to generate signal around 4.5 gigahertz. 4.5 gigahertz times 23 is just over 100 gigahertz, which means we're trying to detect signal around 100 gigahertz range. So the LO then enters the diplexer. We've done a complete measurement of the diplexer. We know how that works. So the LO comes through here, goes through this way, comes all the way over there, and it's going to hit our mixer with a 4.5 gigahertz signal, and it's going to be around 10 to 12 dBm, so a lot of power. Okay, so that takes care of the LO. Now we need to take care of the DC of the mixer too. So if you look over here on the IF port, I actually have a bias T. This allows a DC path from here to go through this cable, and this cable goes up into some instruments, multimeters, and power supplies I'll show you, which means that this wire over here is basically connected at DC only to our diode. Now at the same time, the IF signal coming back from the mixer is going to go back through this port, 
through over here and I have a little USB powered amplifier over here about 25 to 30 dB of gain this signal is going to be at 2.072 gigahertz which is a nominal signal based on the measurement we did on the diplexer and that's going to go into another instrument so we can measure it so everything is taken care of in terms of biasing the mixer providing it with an LO path and capturing the IF signal coming out of it now of course we need a source to generate something around 100 gigahertz so we can detect it and for that we're going to use this active multiplier so the active multiplier has a whole bunch of circuitry inside of it. It takes a signal at one-sixth of the frequency and multiplies it by a factor of six, which means that if I want to generate a signal, let's say, at 100 gigahertz, I only need a 16 gigahertz signal here to do that. And that's coming from a different synthesizer, which I will show you, which means that we can generate a controlled signal between 75 to 110 gigahertz using this signal, feed it into our mixer, and then we can tune the relative frequency of this guy and the LO going in here so that our IF lands exactly at 2.072 gigahertz because we're controlling both the LO source from here and the source into this. And that's our entire setup. Now there's a couple of expectations we have. As soon as we apply the LO, we expect the bias of the diode to shift and we should be able to observe that using a multimeter. And then we will have to override that bias with the power supply to bring the conduction angle of the diode to exactly where it needs to be so it can actually perform that harmonic nonlinear conversion that we're hoping to get from it as a mixer. Now the top over here, we have the instruments we're going to use for DC. This is the power supply for active multiplier. We're going to use the Kitley 2280S, which is a fantastic power supply on its own. And then we're going to use this power supply to override the biasing of the diode. The reason I can use a power supply like this is because these guys have six and a half digit multimeters in them. And they, are cr they can limit current down to microamps or so. So they're really good power supplies for that purpose. And over here, I just have a simple multimeter. This is the DMM650 from Keatley. And this is going to allow us to first measure the rectified self-biasing of the mixer to make sure it's actually doing that and that diode indeed is getting pulled away from its nominal voltage that it's supposed to be. So first we measure it in here and then we bias it over here. Now, where are we going to detect the IF? Well, the IF is sitting at 2.072 gigahertz. And for that, I'm going to use the Tektronix 6 series, 8-channel oscilloscope. It has a 10 gigahertz of bandwidth, an absolutely brilliant oscilloscope. I've done full teardown and review of this as well. We're going to use its special frequency spectrum view capabilities to take a look at the IF signal. We can see it move around. So there's a lot we can do using this instrument. Now, the only one thing that you haven't seen is the source that is providing the signal into our multiplier, which is going to be around 16 gigahertz or so. And that's coming all the way over there because that's the closest synthesizer. And this is the Angelon MXG analog signal generator, which I repaired in one of the previous videos that had a bad module. That's a really cool repair video if you haven't seen it. So all of that works together really nicely. And if everything works, we should be able to see this actually do something and produce an IF signal. So I'm going to share some screens here so we can look at the result. So right now the RF signal going into the mixer and the LO signal going to the mixer are both turned off. As a result, the diode voltage is sitting around zero, it's about 2.4 millivolt. So I'm going to go ahead and turn on the LO signal at 4.5 gigahertz and we should see a huge rectified effect on the diode. There we go. Look at that. So that made a huge difference. Now it's sitting at 1.6 volt, which is way, way above its conduction angle that we want to be. It's a really bad bias condition. Under this situation, you basically get no conversion at the 23rd harmonic. This is basically doing power detection at this point. Not very useful for our purposes. So we need to override that. And in order to do that, I'm just going to simply remove it, like so. Put it in reverse bias condition onto this power supply. I'm going to set the power supply to 250 millivolt or so, and I'm going to turn power supply on. So you can see that it is drawing about 10 milliamp. So that's how I'm bias biasing it. You can adjust it, and as I adjust it, there will be some effect on the IF, which we will see. So right now, there is no RF coming out. But if you look at the oscilloscope, which I will show you a close window of in a second, the oscilloscope here in spectrum view, this center line over here is at 2.072 gigahertz. Right now there is absolutely nothing. What you see here in the time domain is the leakage, a tiny bit of leakage that is coming from the LO signal going into the oscilloscope because this has such a wide bandwidth. So it's detecting all of it. But there is no RF. Now I have already set the synthesizer to the right frequency and if everything is going correctly, as soon as I turn on the synthesizer, a frequency of around 101 gigahertz is going to enter the mixer and they're going to mix together and it should end up at 2.072 gigahertz. Here we go and turn the power supply on. Check it out, it actually works. We do have an IF signal. I'm going to give you a close look at that in a second and we're going to move it around, but the whole thing actually works. So we took something 
that was about 30 years old or so, which was intended to be connected to a very different kind of instrument, and we basically replicated everything needed to bring it back to life. Now we should be able to play around and change the biasing and see the conversion gain in effect. So let's make sure we understand how that IF signal was calculated based on the two LO signals that we were applying. We can do a quick calculation on that. So the LO going into our harmonic mixer is at 4.5 GHz. And we know it, we want it to operate on the 23rd harmonic. So if I multiply it by 23, we get a carrier of 103.5 GHz. That's the center frequency of the mixer. Now I want to apply a signal so that the IF lands in the diplexer's bandpass, which is at 2.072 GHz. Now I want that to be on the lower sideband, so I will subtract that from 2.072, and I get 101.428 GHz. So if I apply that signal into the mixer, the IF should end up where I want it. And if you look at this, synthesizer is over here, that's exactly what I have set it to. There's a time 6 multiplier built into this, and the frequency is 101.428 GHz. Then that's exactly why the IF ends up where it does, so it all makes sense. And here's the screen of the oscilloscope, and here's our tone that we were just looking at. You can see it's sitting exactly at 2.072 GHz. It's sitting at minus 26 dBm, so we can do a rough calculation of the conversion loss of this mixer. There's an IF amplifier sitting in front of it, which has about 25 dB of gain, which means the real signal is actually more like minus 50 dBm coming from the IF port of the mixer. I'm putting in 0 dBm of RF power at around 101 GHz, which means the mixer has a conversion loss of about maybe minus 45 to minus 50 dB, which is pretty bad. There's a few reasons for that. One is that these diodes are old. I don't know if they're been damaged or the conversion loss has degraded over time. But the other thing to note is that there's actually nowhere that I could find what the conversion loss of these mixers would be. Maybe this is normal. After all, this is a 23rd harmonic diode. It can't be that great anyway. But it is going to be pretty bad at this, and it's going to get even worse at the higher frequency ones that I showed you, up to 325 gigahertz. Things are only going to worse. But you're getting this benefit of being extraordinarily simple. You're using the, the simplest possible method to get this conversion and you're paying the price for it. One price is of course being the conversion loss as we talked about. Now what else can we do here? So right now the bias of the mixer is at 250 millivolt and if you remember from the IV tracer on the Keithley, 250 millivolt was roughly the turn on voltage, the knee of that diode of this particular mixer I'm using. And it's no accident because we're putting that mixer bias right at where the nonlinearity happens. If I adjust that bias, the conversion gets, gain gets a lot worse. So for example, instead of 250 millivolt, if I go down to zero, you can see that we indeed suffer somewhat into the conversion gain. And that's normal. That's why the biasing has to be adjustable. That's why you have to control it very precisely. And if I go higher, it's going to get worse even more and you're going to get much, much less conversion. So let's go higher now. So we recover a little bit, and then begin to degrade very quickly. So it's pretty important to bias these mixers at the right place and control the current that goes through them, as we saw from the actual IV characteristic. What's interesting is that this entire behavior can be predicted from the DC response of the diode. You don't even need to do any of these RF measurements to know roughly where it needs to be biased, which is kind of cool. Now, is there a really simple way for us to convince ourselves that we are indeed operating on the 23rd harmonic of this mixer? Well, we can move around the LO frequency that's going into the mixer and see how much the IF moves, and based on that, we can make that calculation easily. So here's the GUI that controls the synthesizer connected right now to the LO port. You can see here 4.5 GHz right over here, and I can make steps of 0.1 MHz. So if I move the LO by 0.1 MHz, I expect the IF to move 23 times that amount because I'm multiplying the final LO by a factor of 23. So we're sitting at 2.072, and if I move it by 0.1, I expect a 2.3 MHz shift rather than a 0.1 MHz shift. So let's go up. And then you just look at that, 2.0743, which is a 2.3 MHz shift, exactly as expected. Now, is the direction correct or not? Well, I said that I have placed the RF on the lower sideband. It's lower than the LO signal, which means that if I increase the LO, the distance between the RF and the LO increases, which means the IF will go to a higher frequency, which is exactly what happened. So if I increase the LO, the IF goes to a higher frequency, if I reduce it, it goes into the lower frequency. And this tells me 
where whether the signal is in the upper sideband and lower sideband and this is at the heart of the signal ID that I talked about earlier this is exactly how you find out by moving the LO back and forth and verifying that if the direction of the LO movement and the direction of the IF movement are the same or in reverse and it tells you whether it's the upper sideband or the lower sideband now what I can do is I can go to my RF source and actually instead of operating at the lower sideband, move it to the upper sideband, so go even above the 103 gigahertz range. Let's see what that happens. And here is the new RF frequency. Now you can see that it is sitting on the upper sideband rather than the lower sideband, so we can take a look and see how the IF and LO move with respect to each other under this condition. So let's try exactly the same thing again. I'm going to increase the LO frequency. And look, it moves in the opposite direction now. That's because right now the signal, the RF signal, is in the upper sideband. And this is exactly the technique used to find out which signal is the real one and which one is the image. So you can see it in action. Now this can be done in software really quickly, so fast that you wouldn't notice that it's done in the background. But this is what you have to do if you do not have a YIG pre-selector. This is a software-based pre-selector to essentially do the same thing. It has, of course, limitations, but it is one way to get around it. Well, we've gone through all this trouble of building this setup, we may as well do something completely crazy with it. So here I have a chopper. These choppers are typically used to block an incoming light so that the light can be chopped at a particular known frequency. I've done experiments with this using lock-in amplifiers, which you can check out. So I thought, well, I don't have any LEDs. How can I measure the rate in which this thing is chopping if I'm not using light? Well, I could use the RF signal at 101 gigahertz or so to do exactly the same thing. So I basically separated the two waveguides from each other with a few millimeters and I've squeezed this chopper wheel in the middle. Every time the chopper is in, in this position, the beam is blocked because it's made of aluminum, essentially fully reflects back. And whenever there's a hole, the beam goes through. Now this has a lot of consequences that needs to be overcome. For one thing, the free space path loss at a few millimeters is already huge, so we're losing a lot of signal, which means that I now need an RF amplifier. So on this side, in front of the mixer, now we have an RF amplifier. I've repaired this RF amplifier in one of the previous videos. It's a 75 to 110 gigahertz amplifier. So let's boost the signal back up. But that's still not enough. We still need some more amplification just to make sure we can do this. I have another amplifier right there at the very end in front of the oscilloscope to give some more boost to the IF. So what happens when I turn this chopper on? Well, I can turn it on like this. And as this chopper turns, it's going to constantly block the beam. And every time the beam is blocked, the amplitude of the IF signal goes down. The rate in which that happens is correlated directly to the speed RPM of the spinning. So we can go back to the oscilloscope and see this effect in action. And here's the result on the scope. These tech oscilloscopes are just amazing. The things you can do with them and the kind of signals you can display, I don't think there's anything like it on the market. So at the bottom, we are looking at the amplitude versus time. And in the middle, we're looking at the spectrum, and on the top, we have the spectrograph. You can clearly see the shape of this waveform. Now, it's not going to look great because the SNR is not that good with this mixer, and the distances and everything makes the signal quite weak. Even with the amplification, you're amplifying the noise also. But nonetheless, the shape is exactly right. This frequency should be around 200 hertz, and it is around 200 hertz. So this is a very silly example, of course. But one of the reasons I like to make complex, unusual setups is that they would really only work if you understand how the instrument works and how the setup works and what the fundamental principle operation here is. So this is a good example of trying to decipher what we're doing and making sure that our measurement matches what we were expecting. This is not normally how things are in the lab because you don't know what you're going to measure. But this is a good exercise in reverse, allowing us to familiarize ourselves with the setup and with the equipment and of course the measurement methodology. And there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this video and the unusual experiments. This just barely scratches the surface of everything there is to know on harmonic mixers. And there's so many cool things you can do with them. But this is how people were able to measure really high frequencies many, many decades ago. As always, thanks so much for the Patreon supporters. And there are other ways to support the channel now on my website, as I mentioned at the beginning, thesignalpath.com. I'm really grateful you guys make these things possible. As I said, none of my content is behind a paywall. This is just a way of giving back to the community. You're supporting everyone. Being able to purchase all these, these components are quite expensive to put together. Let me know what you think in the comment section. See you next time.